Okay, so uh, we're recording now um, because Sylvia is here um, courtesy of FETC. Uh, Sylvia Martinez, I'm sure everybody here is primarily here because of Sylvia. Um, Sylvia it, um, is a featured speaker at FETC, and I think you're, you're, you have seven different talks or six different talks. I'm, yeah, I'm going to, it's going to be all swirling in my mind by the end of FETC, but we're going to do it. We're going to power through. And uh, we picked this topic, or I picked this topic, I guess, from, from really one of the talks, because um, it's kind of interesting to me, it says, you know, education practices for the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and so because I host these, I get to um, have more say. <laughs> uh, I figured that we, it'd be an interesting topic. So um, I do want to encourage people, there's a chat window. I just typed something in chat myself. Um, if you click in chat, you know, you can put questions in chat. If you would like to come up on stage and ask a question, um, I haven't actually forced you to mute or anything. Um, you know, feel, uh, feel free to um, ask questions to Sylvia or, um, or even me. And um, we'd like this to be a, a conversation. So I'm gonna start it off, I guess. And um, I guess, uh, what do you mean by fourth industrial revolution? Oh, well, great question to start off with. Um, so the, the idea of the fourth industrial revolution is that there are, have been, multiple industrial revolutions since sort of the, you know, the one we all learned about in school with the steam engine and the, and, you know, the, the, the fact, the sort of the, the, the factory production model. And each industrial revolution has, has changed the way that mostly people do work. Um, you know, the, the steam engine made, made horsepower and human power the uh, you know a, a sort of old-fashioned way to get work done but the 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 results of each industrial revolution have have not just been in the things it's not just been about steam or railroads or you know factories uh, or even cars and highways um but really it's about how it's changed culture and society and so if we look back at the uh, the first industrial revolutions um we saw the beginnings of, of new ways that people use political power, socialism, democracy, communism, all came out of the changes from the Industrial Revolution, the, the, you know, the, the feudal system going away, new ways that people lived, new ways that people learned. The factory schools model came from the need for the Industrial Revolution of more skilled workers who weren't simply doing an apprentice model, which is a, you know, centuries old model of learning. So a lot of things that we're looking forward to as being the fourth industrial revolution, things like um, continuing to improve not just industrial production, but the way that digital processes are done, the way that transportation is done. Um, we also can look forward to changes in culture. How is school going to change in response to a digital society that's spreading worldwide. How will the practices that seemed, you know, revolutionary a hundred years ago, but now seem like those are old fashioned, how are we going to change what we do on a day-to-day -day basis in schools, in communities, in, in, you know, around the world? How are we gonna change those to meet the needs of this new, new age? And by fourth industrial revolution, what most people are talking about is kind of a convergence of the industrial revolution in things like 3D printers, making the means of production a lot cheaper and a lot more personal. It means a biological revolution where we're actually designing biological organisms and understanding the, the um, efficiencies of, of life in a way that we can apply to uh, manufacturing and living and genetic modification and lots of things. Plus, you're adding in a digital revolution where um, you can communicate, you can do things in a digital way where you're manipulating not just atoms, but you're manipulating bits. Um, in things in, and that includes things like AI, 
So the fourth industrial revolution is a big, big topic, but you know, thinking about where we're going and trying to say, well, what does that mean to us today in a classroom? What does that mean to the kids we teach? What does that mean to the way we teach? What does it mean for what we teach? All of those things are, are I think, really important for educators to, uh, to think about. So as you were talking, there were really two forks that were going on in my mind. Okay, one fork was, well, what should we do? What should we be doing in education to prepare this current generation of students for their lives as we advance in the fourth, fourth industrial revolution? But the other one was, what affordances does the fourth generation, fourth industrial revolution make to teaching that just allows us to teach better? So I think the first question was probably a bigger question, but I'm just interested in the, in the second question also. So w are there tools that the fourth generation makes available that improve pedagogy or improve the way teachers, the way students learn? Well, I, I think that, you know, we're, we're always looking at both teaching and learning as separate things. What, what do you do to teach better? And I think some of the tools that are that are coming up give you um, give students a very direct experience with the world. Um, you know, I I wrote a book about making invent to learn. One of the one of the tools that's come into a lot of schools are three D printers. A three D printer with the software and the hardware together means that students can design three dimensional real objects that illustrate mathematical principles or scientific principles or allow them to do design or to make an invention that no one has thought of before or to fix something. So all of these, all of these affordances are in the tool, but it doesn't mean that it changes the way you teach. You know, buying a 3D printer doesn't suddenly make your school a project-based, constructivist, you know, student-centered school. Um, there's, there's things that are more easy, easy to do when you have very, uh, you know, when students can really use these kinds of modern tools, but it doesn't automatically happen. So it seems to me like with 3D printers, it's, it's not a, it, well, with all technology, it's not about the printer or it's not about the technology, but with the printer, especially if you have one printer for a class, there's doesn't seem to me that there's a lot that you can do with it because you can't have 30 kids designing things and printing them. Exactly. So there are, there are constraints whenever you buy technology, some of which impact what you can do in the classroom, some of which you can mitigate. Lola, well, let's say the problem was that the printers are slow. Well, imagine a day when the printers are faster. Does that make them better? So you can ask very very tough questions, you know, what's the essential element and then say, well, you know, if there are constraints, do I use the constraints? Like every engineering project has constraints, you know, like the size of the print bed is a constraint. Well, you can make interesting projects and have the students constrained to a smaller print bed. So if you, if you think about it, it's, it's not like a small print bed means that a 3D printer is a bad tool for students to use. It just means that you have to be creative with, um, you know, understanding the, creates, uh, the constraints of that tool. If the 3D printer is so slow, it doesn't mean that buying 30 of them makes them better because that just means you have 30 complicated things to deal with <laughs> rather <laughs> than one, you know? So there's, there's lots of things that teachers juggle every day and it's never where we're moving from x you know a to z there's there's these colors in between where you know um how much time you give students how much instruction you give students how much preloading do you show them samples of you know a plus work um all of these things are choices that teachers can make that may make the experience more constrained so constrained that essentially the kids are just like checking things off a checklist and watching the printer work by itself versus they're so unconstrained that no one knows what to do and it's chaos. So somewhere in between there, 
mm-hmm. is the is the sweet spot that sort of Goldilocks experience where it's not too you know it's 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 not so you know it's it's not too much not too little it's it's right in the middle where students are really getting a great experience is are there uh, so I'm, I'm actually looking at some of the questions that people asked when they signed up and uh, oh, one one of the people asked um, you know is there OER pedagogy that you've seen that uh, that teachers or schools should be using so OER pedagogy let's, right. let's that, that was actually that. right yeah open educational resources OER stands for resources that you can go online and get for free or I suppose they could mail them to you, but that's probably not <laughs> happening. Um, so open educational resources means that um, they g- gives teachers a lot of opportunities to go out and seek out resources. Now by resources, what do we mean? We could mean lesson plans. We could mean um, instruction uh, project ideas. We could look at videos of, of you know, people's, you know, uh, STEM classes, or there's, you know, you, there's, a, there's a lot of things that fall under the category of resources. For me, pedagogy doesn't always fully overlap resources. You can have resources in, without pedagogy. To me, pedagogy is an opinion. It's a viewpoint. A pedagogy means that you're choosing curriculum, resources, videos, whatever it is you're, you're planning on sharing with the students, doing with the students, ideas, um, that you're choosing them with a pedagogy in mind, with an opinion in mind about how people learn. I believe that students learn by blank, blank, blank. And if you don't have those blanks filled out, it's really hard to pick resources you just end up sort of throwing things in a, in a barrel and hoping for the best. So I, I think a lot of teachers have, a, have pedagogy that they believe in, especially if you've taught for a while, you develop opinions about how students learn. You develop favorite lesson plans and favorite you know, books to share. Uh, if you're a, 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 a literature teacher, you have books that you know will create good discussions with students, but the books don't create the discussions, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I think that OER is great. Um, I think that you, it's the, it's the time spent choosing and then using those resources that makes all the difference. So you're saying you really begin with a vision of how you think a you should teach and b how students should learn and then you fill it with the with the resources in order to make that happen absolutely and if you can get those for free uh you know so much the better there's there's it's not like the only good ideas in the world are locked up in in textbooks and you know products that you have to buy it's certainly not true um, there's a lot of, of amazing work that's available freely online, some of it in databases, you know, some of it kind of collected and curated, and some of it just kind of, you know, ask the Google. So, uh, you know, now, as you brought up pedagogy, another thought occurred to me that, you know, I, I'd broken things down into two parts before, like, um, are there technologies that allow you to teach in a fourth industrial revolution style, or mm-hmm. are we training people to do to learn fourth industrial revolution things. But um, I'm also thinking, are there fourth industrial revolution pedagogies or philosophies or choices of teaching that are different from the way we've taught in the past? Or, or, or not as a yes, no question, but could you talk about the differences that you would advocate for in terms of, of your pedagogy today versus the traditional pedagogy that we think of when we think, when we think of schools. Well, I think these these new tools and technologies and connections and networks really do support teaching in a, in a different way, in ways that have never been possible before. You know, a hundred years ago, you you might have you know gone to a lecture by John Dewey and heard about students should have experience with the world. Well, 
the 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 kind of experiences that students can have. In Actually, the world I'm not old enough. I'm not old enough to to have done that. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> but this imaginary, and what okay. we're mad, we're traveling back in time with a, a you know some time machine that's going to be invented, um, and we're we're listening to John Dewey pontificate about this. The experience that he was suggesting that students could have were fairly narrow. What could a ten year old do in 1900, right, to experience the world? versus what, what they can do now to experience, uh, you know, the design process using mathematics, to experience, you know, uh, going to a, a place virtually uh, on a field trip, to, to seeing things, to the video, to the, to the, you know, being able to reach outside of the walls of your classroom across the world and talk to people, um, using mathematical tools, using 3D printers, using, um, you know, microcontrollers and computers, the most powerful technology invented in this last century, we can put in the hands of students every single day. And so the experiences that students can have are incredibly more, um, more rich, more valuable, more connected to science and mathematics and, and you know, big ideas that we want children to learn. Um, and so Hopefully, the, the pedagogies that go along with the fourth industrial revolution mean that we can be more integrated in subjects. You know, one of the reasons that all the subjects are cut up into little pieces is just because of the technology of the day, the paper, you know, the slate, the textbook, <laughs> and the library, you just couldn't put everything in one book. Right. right. In, so they, in real life, you don't you don't say, oh, I've got a problem. I'm going to solve this problem by algebra. You know? Right. Right. You know, you, you use all your all the tools at your disposal. So the technology of the day always informs how we how we've taught. You can look back in history from, you know, the pyramids to today and the technology of the day. Like, uh, you know, were books easily available? Well, when they weren't memorization was much more prevalent when books mm. became you know more prevalent we had more people studying books it's like you know of course um and so we're still struggling with the with the structures that were invented for 19th century technology of mm -hmm. you know paper and pencil and we're we're wondering we're we're exploring what's good about that and what should be what we should move on from. And that's, that's tough because it doesn't take long for people to get stuck in ruts. Right. So we're just looking for you to give us some quick answers. Oh, sure. No problem. <laughs> One, two, okay. three. Here we okay. go. <laughs> uh, it's multiple choice, right? So one of the questions that, that um, some, somebody raised, and this was kind of like a, a question that hits, um, well, it hits on so many different levels to me is the issue of, of data privacy and digital mm -hmm. footprint as we go to digital tools. Uh, right. so, so as, you know, as a teacher or as an administrator um, or as a state person, uh, what would your advice be or what would, you, uh, what would you recommend that they think about? So as a teacher, well, it's, it's, that's a huge, that's a huge question. You know, obviously these, these are new topics. Um, it's, they, they're, they're complicated. There are, our, our laws and our customs haven't kept up with the technology. We're sort of on this frontier where we're, we're trying to figure out what's right, what's moral, what's possible <laughs> all at the same time. And we're being pushed forward into new technologies before we've really, we really understand what the capabilities are. Um, so I think it's important for, for teachers to recognize and everyone, administrators and leaders, all of, you know, everyone to recognize that we don't know everything and that the best way to prepare students for the future is to, is to help them learn how to learn is to open up these kinds of technologies that are available today and help students understand that they can be in control of these things. 
that th there isn't just some giant machine doing things to them, that they're in charge of their own data, their own processes, that they can program computers, that computers just do what they're told. And if they're told to do bad things, they will happily march off and do those bad things. It's up to people to have ethics uh, and think hard about pro ethical problems that are going to occur in the future, problems that we don't even realize that we're going to have today. So I think ethics is a huge part of, of um, helping students understand these kinds of moral dilemmas that are going to come up as technology opens these, these unknown frontiers. So as a teacher, I, if I find a tool that I really like, that I want to introduce to my class, and I don't really know what they're going to do with the data. What should I do? I mean, should, could I should I just introduce the tool to the class, or should I just should I not introduce the tool to the class? If I go to my IT department, they're going to just going to tell me no, um, just, yeah, you know, right? Because right. that's the easiest question. But if I'm a teacher and I think, wow, this could really help my students, what what should I do? So first of all. I will never t I will never recommend that anyone right. go against the policy or the law or you know do anything that's harmful to them or is going to get them in trouble or going to get their kids in trouble. That's just it's just not my place and it's not worth it. Um, however, I think that anytime you can you can expose some of these dilemmas to kids, you're ahead of the game. Now I'm not talking about five year olds, but certainly with with 10 year olds where they're at an age where they're completely consumed with the idea of fairness and justice this is you know the classic stage where they become aware of the world and and you know want the world to be a fairer place i think exposing them to some of these dilemmas is a good thing um it, you know i, I i'm I don't know. I don't know if you want to put it up for a class vote, but it would certainly be an interesting discussion. How how do the students feel about their data being potentially used for for marketing? What should we do about it? What can we do about it? Um, and the parents should be involved as well. I think that there's never a a tool that's a must have that involves giving your data away. You know. People say, well, there's, if it's free, then you have to give them your data. Well, um, you know, you don't have to use that tool. Um, so uh, Greg Topo yeah, yeah. had, as usual, a very uh, trenchant question here. Um, so I'm just going to read it for, the, for uh, people who are going to be seeing this on video. Uh, so Greg's comment was, I can see how some could hear you say that students need to learn how to learn and then conclude that teachers are abdicating their responsibility over what they should learn. What's a teacher's responsibility for curating content in the future? That's a great question. And it's a really common miss you know people people hear me talk about project-based learning or student agency and say oh it's just chaos you're just saying the teachers sit back and have a break and the you know the and the students just do whatever they want it's like nope the teacher's responsibility is is crucial their role is crucial and i think the word that you used curating is especially important the idea that um you as a wise elder can guide a conversation where students can still make choices it is a is a really important kind of vision of the classroom now that doesn't mean every day every minute that you don't know what's going on i think that there are there there's a, hmm, how do i say this so if you look at a textbook it's full of stuff they've chosen 10,000 things that a student needs to know in the first month of October in the fourth grade. Now, who's to say that those 10,000 things are correct? Who's to say that a thousand things or two things that you go into, into, complete, into a lot more depth in? Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. If, if it's on the more. test, that's all that counts, right? Okay, I give up. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> yes, you're right. You're right. You can't even talk about this stuff if you're saying, I'm just going to have to teach the kids the three causes of World War II, then let's not even talk about it. 
I'm just going to tell you the three causes. You're going to put them on the test next week and we're just going to move on. Actually, so you know what, you, you know what is the best? So if our, if our teaching techniques are designed to help kids pass tests, there is a proven scientifically proven technique that will give kids the highest scores on the tests. And that is just give them the answers. So that's really, if that's our goal, that's what we should do, right? <laughs> Not getting in trouble on right. that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But clearly, that's you know, not our goal. Clearly, the, clearly, clearly. Um, so, so yes, there's the, the, the test, if, if a test drive everything. And by the way, there's good research that says that teaching students drilling students about test uh, on test prep does not help them in the long run they might get temporarily higher scores but it will also drive them away from loving learning so when i say learn to learn i want to be very clear that i'm not talking about um out of context sort of study skills I'm not talking about like clear your mind and the answer will come to you. No, I'm talking about directly experiencing hard problems that are appropriate for the age level that are constructed by a teacher with the intention to drive students towards the bigger ideas in the curriculum. And that means that teachers have to work together to figure out what those big ideas are. And for a semester in a class, there may only be a handful of big ideas and you might do you know lessons around those ideas experiments around ideas writing around those ideas hands-on discovery around those ideas but but the idea of learning how to learn means you're not telling the students that you know uh, one metal is heavier than another and then moving on you're 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 working them with them on the big idea of of density and properties of materials and that's that that's not something that just happens overnight um some textbooks are better than others some curriculums are better than others um and i think this idea of of learning how to learn is completely tied to to context and content and is not just loose in the world so i'd like to actually maybe even Wait, expand that follow up I'm going to, I'm going to add, Greg asked a follow up. Is inquiry learning another way to say this or are you, are you getting at something else? So I don't like to get stuck in this kind of vocabulary. I, people, people who know these things have very narrow different, you know, definitions of what inquiry learning is. So I'm not going to say yes, that's inquiry learning. Asking questions is a good thing. If kids feel capable to ask and answer questions, I think that's a good thing. I don't think that it should that every lesson should be formed around questions. I think there are other ways to do it. I think people get, you know, there's project-based learning and challenge-based learning and problem-based learning. And I, I, I'm not, I don't want to get hung up on, on one model. And in fact, I don't think you can only have one model. I think if you kind of structure all of your lessons the same way, you get bored. The kids get bored, you know, and after a while, they're just going to go, wow another inquiry learning lesson yuck you know mm -hmm. <laughs> when you had all the best intentions and it was supposed to be exciting and interesting so is inquiry learning another way to say this yes is it the only way to say it no and as you were talking and uh about you know learning how to learn what it also touches on to me that the world is a complex place and what we want to do is we want to prepare kids for dealing with complex issues in a complex world. So it would seem to me that the earlier we, we um, introduce them to complexity and the fact that in a complex situation, uh, you, can't, you can't come up with the right answer, number one. And number two, you may not even be able to come up with a good answer right away. It may take time for something to emerge. And, and part of the job of education is should be uh, to prepare kids to work in those types of environments absolutely i mean i i my college degree was in, in electrical engineering i worked in aerospace on um you know one of my first jobs was on the gps satellite navigation system and the the math that we were trying to 
make work had just been invented. I mean, literally, I was in college the year before and the math that we were using did not exist. I mean, people think of math as being this immutable, you know, centuries old thing, but people are making discoveries in mathematics every day. And to, to think that we can teach kids everything they know, need to know for the jobs of the future is just crazy. But, you know, we all got thrown into the same situation. We were like, we think this math might help us do the job that we need to do. Let's figure it out. Is it useful? Is it the right tool? Is it the right thing we should spend time on? How much time are we going to spend figuring this out before we give up and try something else? All of these questions, um, the, the ability to, to, to answer those questions came from pre, the previous of experience of solving all kinds of different problems, right? Not that problem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'd solved lots of problems in college and, and in the world where I didn't have all the facts. It wasn't four equations, four unknowns. It was eight equations and 17 unknowns. And what do you do? You know, you, you just have to try and nibble away at the problem in, in different techniques. And as you gain experience in different air fields, you tend to get better at solving those kinds of problems. And if we don't give our kids experience in getting good at things, we're depriving them of exactly what they need to, do, to, to know in their hearts that they're good problem solvers, that no matter what's in front of them, they can take a stab at it. If they can't solve it, maybe the kid ne next to them can, maybe the whole class can, maybe the teacher knows, maybe there's an answer on the internet, maybe we can connect with the scientists. They, they don't have to say, well, the answer must be in the back of the book or, or I don't get it. So if I were a social studies teacher or a history teacher or an English teacher, mm -hmm. how could I apply what you're talking? Because one of the things you're talking about is kind of cross curricular and, yeah. um, and learn. So how do I do that when to, to, uh, to a certain extent, I'm, I am trying to get them some facts. Uh, they have to know U.S. history or, or they have to know world history or they have to read the, you know, uh, certain literature. They have to know grammar. They have to know vocabulary. How do, uh, what are some techniques or what are some great lessons maybe that you've heard of for English teachers or social studies teachers or history teachers to use? So I can definitely give you a couple of examples at, at different age ranges. Um, one of the things I have to say first is though that the, the this is one of the reasons that the that as much as I love the idea about the STEM subjects being you know so all fired important, is that every subject is important, and you know we can't just say well these are important and that's not because the same techniques of giving kids experience in the world work for, for all subjects. And that, that's what kind of excites me about STEAM. Even though the arts may seem like one subject, I, I think of it as, as every kind of human experience. Kind of an S-H-T-E-E-A-M, right? <laughs> yeah, hamster. It's the right. hamster curriculum. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'll, I'll, kidding aside, uh, I, I can tell you about a high school history teacher that I know. She's one of the Fabler and Fellows named Heather Pang. She works, she's a, she's an eighth grade history teacher and, and she works in a school with a, with a maker space. You know, it's a beautifully equipped maker space, but that's not the point of the, of, you know, you don't have to have the perfect maker space to do this. And one of the projects she has her students do at the end of the semester is to make a monument to a famous person that they've studied over the year. Um, and, you know, Heather, they have a laser cutter, they laser cut it, they make it to scale, they write, you know, the, the inscriptions, they do, they do everything. Um, and, you know, Heather said to me, it's, it's not that she thinks laser cutting teaches history better, but that the conversations that she has with her students are substantially different when, the, when they simply wrote reports or, you know, did a stand up about, you know, Betsy Ross or, 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 or something. Um, she says that the, that the kids really grapple with the act of making a monument, that the, how do you explain history to other people? If you make a statue and it's, you know, Shirley Chisholm and you put, you make it doves flying, well, how do you know if that's an ornithologist or a peace activist or, 
someone who hated birds or, you know, <laughs> how would you know? And, and so she says what she feels that she's teaching is that the actual job of being a historian is to, is to unfold history for other people. And that the students in the act of creating an actual monument are, are actually having a better experience of being a historian. So I think that with that in mind, anytime you can help students be an engineer, be a historian, be a paleontologist, be a writer, a real writer, you know, um, be a musician, not just study about math or music or history or learn about a famous you know, mathematician. I think anytime you can give students the real experience of, of making a real thing, um, you're a, a leg up. It's not perfect. Um, and you can, you can certainly go back and forth between technical projects and um, you know, projects that support language. There was a recent study that we, we just put in our new book. We just released the second edition of Invent to Learn. And there was a tremendous number of great studies. Um, and I put one in the book about um, making, helping ELL students. Because what happens when you have to make something? Well, you have to talk about it. You have to discuss it with others. You have to read directions. You have to you know, program. You're using the language in a context that's exciting to you. It helps you learn the language. And yet, in a lot of schools, ELL kids aren't allowed to go into the makerspace or to special STEAM classes because first they have to like learn the basics. And I think that's just upside down from the way kids really learn. Well, there are whole schools th that believe that if a if kids that are catering to kids who are performing at a below grade level academic standard, um, who go in and say, you know something, before we can give, before we have the luxury of letting kids be creative in those things, we have to catch these things up. So we're gonna drill and practice them until they're caught up. Uh, and only then are we going to are we going to possibly let them um, do creation and, and making things like that. And I have a feeling that that kind of makes your blood boil. Like it makes my blood boil, actually. But it kind of it probably makes your blood boil as well. Can you imagine how boring that is? How, yes. how boring is that for the kids? <laughs> how would they ever catch up if if they're just being you know reading baby books and and taking tests. I mean, I've, I, there's a, there's a, so one of the workshops we did in Italy, one of the teachers just sent, a, sent us an email and uh, said that the, she's, she runs a robotics lab for all the kids in her high school. And we, di we went in and did a micro bit coding workshop. And she said, she told us that one of the students who is not good at school was like, you know, he was the star of the workshop. He came up with the craziest ideas. And she said, she was talking to the, him the other day and, and he said, I'm not a person who has good ideas. I'm not a person who's smart. I'm not a person who does well in school. It's like, oh yes, you are. But school's telling him day in, day, day in and day out that he's not good at, 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 at anything. He gets bad grades. So why do you, why do you stay, stick around if you're getting bad grades and people are telling you you're not smart? Well, you know, and then she also said that the math teachers were coming into her robotics lab and pointing to the kids and saying, how come there are stars here and they're not in my class? What's going on? And it's like, that's a really good place for, for a conversation among teachers to start. Right. It's funny because that, that yeah, would require te uh, teachers to kind of go meta and say, well, wait a minute, how come kids are able to, to be stars here? They're not being stars in my class. Maybe it's not just the kids. Maybe there's ways, things that I can do to better reach the kids. The, the problem of teachers not having enough time is it has so many ripples. Yes. You know, I, I talk to teachers all the time and they're like, you're nuts. You know, when am I supposed to do all this after playground duty, lunch duty, the one, you know, minute I get to go to the bathroom on a good day, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And I'm like, look, I'm not denying your reality. Um, but 
something has to change. And schools who are, who are working hard, there are a lot of schools who work, are working very hard to try and make things better. And one of the primary things they can do is increase the conversation time for teachers to collaborate with each other, to visit each other's classrooms, to have you know, what the Japanese call lesson study, um, to have you know, a critical friend that, who you trust to come in and say, you know, I could try this or you could try that or, you know. Yeah, how about 20% time for teachers? Yeah, really. Um, you know, American teachers in particularly, it's, there's been worldwide studies, have the least amount of non front of the classroom time of any teacher in the world. And, right. and what's, what's the result of that? They're overwhelmed. They don't have time to, to plan new things. They don't have time to incorporate new ideas or, you know, read a book or take a break or, have, you know, do something interesting and bring it into the students to share. And, you know, we've got. So if you're a teacher working at a school like that. Yeah. What are there? Is there anything you can do other than leaving, retiring? You know, is there. Oh, I, I, look, you know. I went, I've been around the world in the last like five years working with schools who just said it's going to happen and it happened. I mean, there's no magic wand. There's no seven point, you know, post-it note framework. It's not going to happen magically. It's, it's hard work. It's people sitting down, taking the time, you know, including parents, including students, including administrators and everyone saying, we're going to make this work better for our kids. And you set out with whatever goal seems to be most doable and you, you try and work on it. It's, it's, it's hard human, <laughs> human work. So just there's um, an, a, another interesting question from people when they were registering yeah. was if you're working in a school and the school has 400 students and there are 20 Chromebooks in the school, how do you do this? And you're a teacher, you know, a principal, you could say, well, okay. get more Chromebooks, but you're a teacher. So this right. is your environment. You can't, you know, there's certain things you can't it. change, right? Look, I think any, anytime you're faced with a, with a resource, resource shortage, you know, you, you, you decide what you're going to do to work around that, right? If, you're, if your 400 students have to share 20 computers, do all of your teachers want to use them? I would say that it would be perfectly acceptable, you know, it's, if a teacher says, if I'm going to get the, the, the Chromebooks five minutes every other Tuesday, what's the point? You know, so give them up. So I, I, you know, the first thing I do is have a super serious conversation with all of the teachers and say, this is, this is it. What do you guys think we should do? Does everyone want to use them? Well, we'll try and get more, but until we do, what are we going to do? Are we going to have a sign out sheet? Are we going to put them on a cart? What do you want to do with them? And then you have to make tough decisions. If, it, you know, when I was, I was um, at a conference um, two weeks ago and, you know, one of the women asked the question essentially like this. And she said, I, I have my kids, uh, you know, 20 minutes a day for one day a week they i get them friday afternoons every other week for like 45 minutes and i'm mm -hmm. supposed to be the steam teacher i'm supposed to be teaching you know all of the connections with science and technology and engineering and math and and i said and she says what do i do and i said look you're this is a scheduling question with a political answer right there is no good answer to the what do i do with 20 chromebooks question there's no good answer. Look, you can come up with clever things to, to put a Band-Aid on it. Maybe all the other, one teacher will say, I claim them, I get them all the time, and the rest just go, I give up. Who knows? So you might come up with something clever, but there's no fair answer where all the kids are going to have a good experience using a computer in, in, under those conditions. So the answer has to be political. What are you going to do to get more? What are you going to do once you get more? Um, it's, it's not, you know, shopping is never the answer either. It's not like I'm going to say, well, if you only had 400 Chromebooks, all your problems would be solved, right? Because right. now right. the problem is what are you going to do with the Chromebooks? What are the kids going to do beyond, you know, okay. going online? And, 
and Google's going to Google's going to kill me for this, but I'll you know I but I talk to people all the time and say nobody would voluntarily buy a Chromebook for themselves, <laughs> and we only buy Chromebooks for kids because they don't vote and they don't they don't get a choice because they're it's a keyboard with a screen with underpowered processor and not enough memory. It's not like you can do a lot of you know there's a lot of things that we would want kids to be able to do on devices that Chromebooks can't do. But anyhow, that's my, I'll get off my soapbox. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I um, so I'm just looking at, well, another, another interesting question, it was about wearable technology and robotics. So here we go from one end with a school that has 20 Chromebooks for 400 students. And then the question mm -hmm. about, well, what about wearable technology and robotics? So let's go to that, you know, where, um, where do they come in? Um, so I think wearable technology is a, is a, a, a hugely fascinating and, and fun area um, to introduce the idea of physical computing. So robotics is one kind of physical computing. Um, to me, physical computing is one of the main, the big ideas of the maker movement. And uh, this idea that there's a connection between the physical analog world and the digital computer world. And mm -hmm. you can control things from your computer in the real world. You can collect data from, from the physical world into your computer, manipulate the data, you know, and, and have a feedback loop and things like that. You can use sensors to understand the world around you and then act on the things that, that the sensors tell you. Uh, there's, there's, the room is too noisy. There's pollution in the air. Uh, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's too light, it's too dark. All of these things you can take in and do something about them. So wearable technology and robotics are both kind of um, under this umbrella of physical computing. And, you know, I think both of them are great ways for students to experience all of the, sub all stem, you know, the STEM subjects, STEAM subjects combined. Uh, when you have to program a robot to do something, you're, you're understanding the world around the robot, you're putting yourself in the place of the robot, you're understanding the mechanical parts of the robot, the, the digital parts of the robot, um, and you know, kits and tools that allow the students to have as much control as possible, I think are the way to go. I wouldn't recommend a robot where you just say, pushed a button and the robot went off and did something. What, what's the point of that? Are you teaching kids to push buttons? It's, you know, so there's a lot of questions when that we tackled in in the book Invent to Learn um, about choosing the kinds of materials that really provide the students with the most agency over what their robot can do. Wearable technology is another kind of physical computing. Small computers that are battery powered that can make things that you can wear. You know, your Fitbit is wearable technology. It's just made by a company and you can't really do a lot with it. You know, I'm sure there are Fitbit hacking sites where people have opened them up and you can, you know, connect them and do other things. But um, the, the kinds of wearable technology with small microcontrollers like uh, lily pads and Adafruit has a whole line of small microcontrollers that you can control lights and things and, you know, make, make cool light up purses and headbands and, jackets and you know all kinds of stuff um provide kids with the same rigorous engineering experience as a robot does just because a robot is sort of hard and square and a wearable technology is sewn into fabric doesn't mean that 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 you know that they're different or that one is easier than the other or more valuable than the other uh the design process is the same you know, an idea starts in your head. Every project starts, every design starts in someone's head. You make it real in the world with the technology you have available to you. When you make it real, you want to make it work. And the great thing about these new technologies today is they're cheap and affordable and you can make real things, not just models of things. And when you make it work, you want to make it better, which creates this iterative design cycle where your making things work creates better ideas. And if you have good tools and a supportive community around you, you can continue that cycle. And of course you have to have time, the toughest thing. 
So I, I want to encourage other people, because uh, I'm answer, answering or asking a lot of the questions. Um, and Greg has another great question, so I'm going to read that. But please, yeah. anybody else who has questions, uh, if you have a microphone and you want to come up and, and ask a question, please do. If you want to type it in, please do. But um, I'll read Greg's question. Uh, uh, Sylvia, you talked earlier about subjects needing to be integrated. Will automation, AI, machine learning make certain subjects obsolete in school? As it's as um, as it's doing as it's doing for work, will automation make routine, repetitive schools schoolwork pointless? I'm thinking about things like basic grammar, math operations, etc. I could see a clear downside to that. So maybe you can expand on that. So honestly, I think there's some upside to that as well. I think there are things that we teach in school that are pointless, and maybe AI will just kind of make it obvious. Um, you know, Stephen Wolfram, like one of the greatest mathematicians in the world says that we spend thousands of human lifetimes every day teaching kids to do what a, what a $4 calculator can do. And, and I know it's a good thing to have a basic understanding of, uh, of how mathematical operations work, but we drill kids endlessly on a lot of pointless things. Um, that that I don't think make them more capable of solving real problems. Um, I think that AI certainly has has the potential to um, be an interesting addition to school. I I don't like a lot of the AI I, AI enhanced kind of education products that I see. I think it's uh, used too much for surveillance. Uh, I think it's used too much to just kind of generate problem sets for students that aren't particularly helpful. Um, and I think that the, the real power of AI is if students can learn to create their own programs and robots and things that have, have AI modules in them. If they can understand that AI is a set of algorithms and a way that machines learn that's controllable by humans and controllable by them, I think that's a very powerful stance for students to have. AI used to do things to kids, I think is, is, is a terrible idea. But do, and what types of things do you think AI um, will make it so that, you know, do kids, do kids have to learn spelling? Because the spelling correctors will, will, will fix them. Do kids have to know grammar? And what, what's, what do you see as pluses or minuses there? So I think that when you talk about inter integrating subjects, you're also integrating within subjects. That within the English language curriculum, looking at spelling as separate from grammar, as separate from reading, as, as separate from writing, it, it is, is, an, is not you know, the way to go. I think you, you, you look at, when you look at those things as being all integrated, in the process of wanting to make meaning in the world, which almost all humans want to do, kids want to have their ideas out in the world. When there are reasons for them to spell things correctly and use correct grammar, and when they have experiences with a lot of reading, when kids read well-written things, they start to understand the rules of grammar. You can't, you know, you, this, this is how people learn. You learn by being in a culture of of good reading and and good writing and people being interested in in writing and being interested in the things that kids write and the kids things that kids think um i think that that uh those the the intrinsic motivation pulls all those things together in a way that's impossible to do otherwise so it's, it's what I'm hearing is that it, when you can get the kids really engaged um, they're and you can coach them, you know, then, then yeah, yeah. they're going to, they're going to learn what we want them to learn just because that's the way our biology works. Um, we all gain uh, a great deal of pleasure from learning and, uh, and wanting to make meaning of the world of the world. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the way we've broken things up in the past and, and to these separate items really, 
has, has tended to detract from that. And as we see in this fourth industrial re revolution, uh, there's there's even more demand to reintegrate things, and which also remotivates kids. That's right. What I was trying to so, so let me give you an example in in a in a completely different um, uh, subject area, but one that people ask me about all the time. Should all children learn to program? Right. Should all children learn computer science? Which actually I think are two separate questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll tackle that. So I think that all children should have experience with computers, be able to program them, and be able to use them to do things in the world. Things on the screen, things in real life, they should be able to program robots, they should have experience with different programming languages. And then some of those kids will go on to formal computer science education. And they will learn the proper way to write if loops, and they will learn about you know correct syntax, and you know. But the rest of them will have had a good experience, and and understand the world better, and be able to say, if they um, if 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 they want to help their city manage noise pollution they might say to themselves, hey, I know how to do that. I know how I can get a sensor and I can put that sensor up in the main square and, and collect the data and take the data to my city council and show my city council that the noise pollution is terrible and we should do something about it. You know, that doesn't take a degree in computer science. In fact, it shouldn't. You know, we, sh we shouldn't just rely on, you know, a sci scientists who have advanced degrees to help us solve our problems. The whole point of the maker movement and making this, this, you know, technology accessible to everyone is that people can solve the problems that they care about, whether they're scientists or programmers or, you know, musicians or, or concerned citizens or whoever you are or eighth graders you know if you have a problem that you care about in the world you can figure out how to how to solve it and i think that when you give kids these these highly motivating uh, experiences in school it carries on into other aspects of their lives and then some of them will have formal studies in english language arts and some will have formal studies and become historians and some will become you know will will teach music theory and some will you know do, what, uh, take a job that hasn't been invented yet um and so i think it's very important for for us to look at the opportunities when kids are young to expose them to all of these powerful experiences where they can have control of the world and make meaning in the world so what I'm hearing is there should be kind of a, there should be a baseline. And, and then after that baseline is covered, then, um, then to give kids more free reign to go into their own passions. I kind of said the opposite. Okay. Well then I misunderstood. <laughs> I kind of said, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of things that you can do without having formal, um, formal representations and formalized uh, you know, understandings of the world. And then the students who want to specialize in those things start to un start to be taught the formalisms. Okay. Because what, formalism yeah, what, what I understood is that um, there should be a certain level of math that people should understand. There should be a certain base. There should be a certain amount of um, programming, coding, think using computers to do things that people understand. There should be a certain amount of English that people that that kids should get. And so there, that's the way I understood is that there's kind of a yeah. foundation, but we're that we need. Base, yeah, we're using the word baseline in, in a different oh, way. Then I, then I, okay. Yeah. But, but we I may kinda, be I agreeing read, on the thought, but. but I the, think so. I okay. think I read baseline as basics, right? That all oh. kids need to have these kind of boring out of context rules of the road before they no, actually no 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 I no I didn't mean that okay. yeah right okay hey this is Greg can you hear me hey Greg yes so I, I just oh I guess I figured I should stop typing and start talking <laughs> good for you but I guess you know just you mentioned Wolfram earlier I mean he he might say something like you know teaching multiplication skills um, is kind of a waste of time. 
or you know because you just have a two dollar calculator as you say to to do the work for you but i guess maybe you know the traditionalist in me says something like you know if a kid doesn't sort of like deeply understand that eight times seven is 56 and have sort of an automaticity about it then they can't kind of take the next step and they can't have sort of satisfying mathematical experiences that lead them to these places you want them to go. Am, am I just looking at it upside down? Um, I think there's some research that says that, that the, the focus on automaticity and speed harms kids. That, well, I'm not even worrying about speed, I'm just worrying about yeah because um, there's another line of thinking that says that that the kids who automatically know their number facts end up doing significantly better in algebra and if kids are not doing better well in algebra if you can get them to be automatic in their number facts then they then a number of them will do better in algebra um i i think look I'm not saying that it should be like the, the, that we should raise wolf children, right? <laughs> no. And I just want to say it's after it's, yeah. it, it's, we're, uh, let's target like four minutes and then, okay. and then stop because okay. we're over time. No, because, and I think that reasonable people can disagree about things. I think that, that you have to, even if you agree that a certain level of automaticity is helpful. Although I swear, eight times seven is my black hole. I kind of have a black hole in the middle of the multiplication chart. Yeah, that's why I, I <laughs> You know, I always kind of like count by sevens from and go, oh, 49 plus, plus okay, I got it. You know, so, you know, I, and I have an engineering degree, so who knows? Um, but I think there's, there's some, you have to, you have to really think about the harm you do to some kids, um, feeling of, the, the feeling of, of, mastery over you know over the world gets harmed when they're constantly told they're wrong that you know um most kids will come into these understandings on their own terms in their own way especially if there are things that they need to do with that in with that skill um and that forcing them to do things like time math test, which is the way we ask kids to learn the times tables, um, just convinces some kids that they're bad at math and it can't be fixed. And that's, that's, a, that's damage that can't be undone. Or it's very hard to undo. Okay, so, so now lead us from that to the fourth industrial revolution. Oh, sure. No problem. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I think that, that these kinds of topics are, are, are great, you know, in one way because they're big and expansive, but the question <laughs> is, comes down to wh what do I do on Monday? What do I do with the 20 Chromebooks? What do I do with the principle, you know, requiring spelling tests and time math tests? And I think that that's a position that, that teachers are struggling with these days. It's like, you're, you have to have two minds at once. You, you want to look at the big ideas. You want to have a plan for the future. You want to teach classes that are engaging and fun and, and show kids that the world out there is a wonderful place full of amazing things, that they're going to be a part of it. And on the other hand, there's a test on Wednesday, you know, there's a, or Friday or whatever tomorrow is. Um, and you can't just say to the kids, oh, don't worry about it. The fourth industrial revolution is here. So, you know, I think that, that teachers do an amazing job on this juggling impossible things in, in, uh, every, in not enough time. And I'm not just pandering or sucking up. I truly believe this. Um, and, and that, you know, when we talk about these things, it's not like, oh, we just drop everything. Everything we do now is bad. We're going to do some magical thing in the future that's good. No, it's all, it's all, part, of, it's all part of the process. And I think as, as teachers, you know, learn how, how they, you know, grow and grow in their professionalism, they can adapt and adopt things that are, that are new and keep the things that are, that are good. Um, and hopefully they're in a, they're in a place where their administration and the support that they get from colleagues, um, helps them, you know, have roots and grow at the same time. 
And they can learn more about all of that at FETC. And what's your new book? And when's it coming out? Um, the, the, the book, the, the second edition of Invent to Learn is out right now. You can learn all about it at uh, inventtolearn.com, uh, plus all kinds of resources for the maker movement. We just released a brand new book from our publishing company, Constructing Modern Knowledge Press, uh, cmkpress.com, called The Art of Digital Fabrication, STEAM Projects for the Art Studio and Makerspace, which is a really uh, beautiful book about kinds of projects you can do with digital fabrication tools from vinyl cutters to, to laser cutters and 3D printers. And more soon. And you did all the work for that. There's this guy named Gary Stager. He didn't do anything, right? Gary Stager and I run the publishing company and he, he kind of, you know, scouts out the books and, and, you know, and, and he mostly works with schools. So when we work with, with schools going to talk to them about like how to adapt and adopt their programs, Gary does that. I run the publishing side. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and I, um, well, I had to needle him a little bit, so. Um, <laughs> okay, if you had to. If I had to. Um, so, well, oh, well, thank you. And I'll see you okay. at FETC, because I'll be there, and okay. maybe at a conference even before then. And um, happy trails. Um, well, thank you. I'm looking forward to FETC. I think it's a wonderful conference, and, um, you know, really appreciate them doing, doing the work to tell people uh, about it ahead of time. So, okay. And I'm Mitch Weisberg. I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive and hope to see you all next week and at other EdChats. Good night.